saying what can the community do for us or how can the community come in and make our churches bigger. We want to give out. Behavioral health is essential to help treatment works, people recover, and the prevention also works. Welcome to Soon You Need to Find the Solution. I'm your host, Phil McElveen. It is Mental Health 2013. We're talking about Mental Health First Aid Arizona and a whole bunch of other topics underneath the scope of mental health. Um, if you haven't heard lately, in reference to uh, crisis, different aspects going around the United States, tragedies, a lot of association has, has been associated with mental health, a lot of stigmas. Uh, for those of you that are in from Idaho and uh, don't know what that means here in Arizona, uh, that means something associated with uh, a cause that isn't necessarily true. So uh, we decided to partner with a lot of agencies, state agencies, local networks, uh, provider network organizations, regional behavioral health authorities, to give you a uh, full scope of not only needs, services in the Valley, but also allow for the whole state of Arizona on a statewide campaign to have access to different phone numbers for crises, um, services, and hit parts of Arizona that may not be touched. So that's our main goal of the campaign is to reach out to the person who still suffers. With that, I'm going to introduce my guests today. First of all, I have Suzanne Rabideau from Crisis Response Network. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you for having us. As well. Suzanne is the CEO of Crisis Response Network. Um, Crisis Response Network pretty much has a name all in its own, so I'm going to let you kind of lead off a little bit what it does Crisis Response Network do. First off, Phil, thank you so much for joining us, for asking us to join you. Um, it's so important for us to be able to share with the community what we do, what resources are available to people. The Crisis Network basically helps people that are not doing well in life, and they can reach out, make a phone call, and begin to turn their lives around. And whether it's talking to them on the phone, or dispatching a mobile team out into the community, or having them go to an urgent care facility, there is help. There is help for people. Now, when you say crisis, a lot of people say, well, it's, I've got to be bleeding, or somebody's got to be in imminent danger. Or, is that only what your lines are for? You know, a crisis is self-defined. And so anybody who is experiencing something that they're not sure how to cope with in life, and it can be a minor worry, or it can be an extreme worry. The other thing is, is that people can call for themselves, or they can call for a loved one or a coworker they're concerned about. They can call about anything that they're worried about. And it is from things like they're not quite sure how to help make sure their child gets up in the morning and gets to school, or someone who's just very, very, very depressed and they don't want to live. Or they may be just their life is so out of control and they might be at risk to hurt other people. So it's any of those things. People can call and get help. We're going to go to a video here in just a second as soon as I queue it up. Um, what a responsibility. Um, that you have, um, not only as an agency to network, but um, uh, being able to serve that population, which is Maricopa County and Pima County, That's correct? That's correct. Um, but that crisis response has to do with coordinating different services with different agencies. 
um, probably police department as well. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to video. We're going to show a little bit about what Chrysler's Response Network does. Take a look. I think everything that we do every day helps someone, uh, whether it be a teenager up to an elderly person. Um, whenever they call here, they will be assured that they will get some type of help. Having family members that have mental health um, issues um, help me better connect with the people that I talk to every day. The Crisis Response Network sometimes sends out people like David and Tiffany, specialists on a mobile team from Teros, a behavioral health organization. Calls because they get a lot of calls. On average, 57 mobile teams head out each day from Teros and another organization, La Fonterra Impact. I've been in the mental health field for 26 years. I'm actually surprised when I find out that, that this particular service doesn't exist in every city in the, in the country. You do the best you can on every call. And no two calls are exactly the same. Well, we've gone out on toddlers to, you know, uh, 100 year olds. From on the street, that second floor space. It's awesome to be able to make a difference in the lives of the people that call. No matter who you are, what you look like, what pay bracket you're in, um, none of that really matters. What really matters is if you feel like you are in need, we are able to help out in some way. If we can't if ourselves do the help, then we will do our best to find someone else that can help. And I'm sure that is a small portion of what Crisis Response Network does. So, uh, Suzanne, why don't you introduce your guests? Thank you. You're welcome. First, we have uh, Dr. Manuel Medina, who is the Vice President of Diversity for Taros. And we also have Erica Chestnut, who is an Associate Director of Crisis Services from La Frontera to Impact. Welcome, Mr. Medina. Thank you, Phil. And, and Pleasure well, to be here. I know you and Erica as well, knowing La Frontera. Yes. Uh, uh, what is your role with Crisis Response Network? Well, we're part of the, the network that provides the, the, some of the calls as well as the two-man teams that go out. As you saw there in the clip, you know, those uh, individuals that go out, we have master's level, bachelor's level, trained, formerly trained individuals. They really represent the front line of helping the individuals and community deal with tr trauma, traumatic incidents that are occurring in their lives. And to be able to have someone on site to come and help you when you're feeling isolated, overwhelmed, that really goes a long ways to reconnecting them back to um, services that they really need. Sometimes it's connecting back with family members and community that will help them deal with that individual's trauma. So You know, I was just running through my mind talking about that connection that you're talking about and connecting and also that uh, de-escalation, that process that probably goes along with that to try to prevent them from getting to the level over at Impact Suicide Prevention Center as well. When you, when you have your crisis mobile teams, which I'm familiar with, um, at the same token with Teros, uh, how many units do you guys run? And how often do you run them? Are they 24-7? We run it 24-7, so there's always availability for the community out there. So both, both uh, Eric and I's program provide that. So I'm at home, um, uh, 29 years old. Um, just kidding. But, <laughs> oh, well, you know, I've done 90 shows in a week, <clears throat> went to 90 meetings, and I want to jump in front of 90 cars, and right, I call right. the number, not suicidal, but I'm just not feeling good and I'm sure, depressed. Sure, Is that something that, um, that crisis response handles? Absolutely. That's a perfect kind of call that would come into the crisis line. And we're going to try to resolve that with the person on the phone. And if we feel like, you know, this isn't just coming to a resolution and we don't have a good plan for safety and what the next steps are, that's when we would go ahead and dispatch one of the mobile teams from crisis, uh, from Terros or from La Frontera Impact. So La Frontera Impact, which I'm familiar with as well, um, welcome very, very Thank much. You. And uh, welcome to have you, Erica. Erica is Associate Director for Crisis, crisis Services, mm -hmm, is it? That's correct. Okay. So is, is your role the same as Teros? Does it differ in, in, in any way? Somewhat. We also partner with the Crisis Response Network to provide a variety of crisis services. We do the, the two-person mobile teams as well as providing uh, some services to children who are in CPS custody. So we have two specific programs that deal with that. We go out into the homes, provide behavioral health and developmental screenings for the children, and really connect them to the ongoing care that they need. We provide the uh, relative placements or the foster placements. 
with resources to help them meet the unique needs of that child and to be able to care for that child in the most appropriate way. Now, is that the same as high needs or um, as they classify it? And maybe terminology may be wrong, but um, is there a prevention aspect as they come in, a service aspect and, and a support and follow-up aspect as well? Or is that as a combination between you and different agencies? We do that as well. When we go in, we provide that education to try and help prevent crises so it doesn't reach that level for the children. Uh, and then we also connect them to the ongoing care that we may need or that they may need when we see that need for them. And then we also do some follow-up services for the children to make sure that they are connected to that care and that they are receiving the level of service they require. Before I get to the question that I, I, I know that you want to talk about, uh, you know, what I want to let you know, the community, there's a lot of unknowns. And one thing I know from for recovery personal, personal wise is I didn't find out about a lot of stuff until I was in it. Um, and I've been involved in Behavioral Health Network for a while, and I'm still learning that there's stuff out there that I don't know exists. Mm -hmm. For the person at home that's never heard of you, never taken advantage of the services or Teros or, or Impact or La Frontera, um, nonetheless, um, some of the services up and above crisis response, which they may think, well, I'm in crisis, I make a phone call, they talk to me, and a van goes out. I mean, what they don't understand is the scope of services that are available. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. You know, you mentioned earlier about high needs, low needs. I think what's real important for viewers to know is, is that it do, all of that doesn't matter. What's important for people to know is something's not right in my life or in the life of other people. And our goal is going to be let's help them resolve the immediate issue that's going on for them and then connect them to a, a whole host of resources and help them discover their own resources. They may have private insurance. We're going to help them connect up with their insurance provider. There may be a coach in the kid's family that's very, very helpful. We're going to involve the coach. There may You never know what resources are available to every individual that calls. And we're going to uncover that and help connect them. And that's a very important piece of what we do, is we resolve and we connect them to that next steps. Because many times in crisis, we're not going to res everything's not going to be great at the point of hanging up the phone. People are going to begin their journey journey of to wellness to wholeness and to getting back to a life of being wanting to go to work wanting to go to school being involved in social activities wanting to go to church wanting to volunteer wanting to do whatever's happening on Saturday you know it's March in, in Arizona and it's beautiful out and some people don't want to do that and our goal is to help them figure out what's going on in their life and help them get back on a track of being well and that's really really awesome we're gonna actually talk about services and and um savings on the system and different stuff when we come back with you on the second half of the break. Um, I usually like to ask a, a couple of personal questions, uh, business personal as well, when we get on the show. You know, I can say this a lot, uh, being the host of the show, but the reality is there's such a stigma out there with what's the tragedy in new towns and different uh, aspects of such horrible things that go on in the United States that uh, mental illness and mental health get such a bad rap, and I'm going to say it like it is. And the reality of it is, is uh, less than 2% of people with mental illness even fall into a category like that. Uh, an addict and an alcoholic have a 9% more chance of, of actually um, being involved in a violent crime than somebody with mental illness. As a matter of fact, people with mental illness usually are the victims. Um, and I want to make that very clear. Um, uh, Erica, if you could say one thing to the camera over here, which would be the people out there, one wish that you'd want them to take with you, what would it be? Um, I believe that people with mental illness, uh, it's not a choice. I think that's one of the most important things to remember is that they can't simply choose to act differently because this is a brain disorder with mental illness. And it's important that we get trained professionals in there to be able to help them and provide them with the level of service that they need. So please intervene quickly. Dr. Medina, one thing if you wanted to get out to the community, what would it be? I think the important thing would be that um, Crisis and the issue of mental illness, you know, is a brain disorder, and that it really it shouldn't have that kind of stigma as being crazy, if you will. You know, it really is help. We know we have a lot of signs behind it now. But I also wanted to make this important point is that we provide services in 28 different languages. And being bicultural, bilingual services that go out, especially those mobile teams, to interact with all of the communities in Maricopa County that reside. That's really important to be able to understand that as well. So, so people, communities that typically get really isolated are also at high risk. So being able to have that capacity to reach out 
and provide services in 28 different languages is really critical. Wow. Suzanne, we'll get more from you when we come back. Uh, Erica Chestnut, thank you very much for Law Frontier Impact thank Suicide you. Prevention. Dr. Medina from Teros. My pleasure. Thank uh, you. Is it Behavioral Good Health Services now? Yes. Is that what it is? For more information, go ahead and look on your screen. Um, it'll be, uh, you can go to stnaz.tv, you can go to aztv.com, and we'll have some more information on Crisis Response Network as well. And we will be uh, back right after the break. Thanks. Let me There's no stigma or discrimination against the heart, the liver, the kidney, even the gallbladder. It doesn't even have a job. Yesterday, depression was kept in the dark. And bipolar disorder was your best friend's mother's problem. But the tide is turning. We're stopping the stigma. We're coming out. Our goal is to make the discussion of mental dis-ease cool and trendy. No kidding? Me too. No kidding. Me too. No kidding. Me too. It's time we gave the all-American brain some peace of mind. I think everything that we do every day helps someone, uh, whether it be a teenager up to an elderly person. Um, whenever they call here, they will be assured that they will get some type of help. Having family members that have mental health um, issues um, help me better connect with the people that I talk to every day. The Crisis Response Network sometimes sends out people like David and Tiffany specialists on a mobile team from Teros, a behavioral health organization. Calls, because they get a lot of calls. On average, 57 mobile teams head out each day from Teros and another organization, La Fonterra Impact. I've been in the mental health field for 26 years. I'm actually surprised when I find out that, that this particular service doesn't exist in every city in, in, the, in the country. You do the best you can on every call. And no two calls are exactly the same. Well, we've gone out on toddlers to, you know, uh, 100 year olds. From on the street to that second floor space. It's awesome to be able to make a difference in the lives of the people that call. No matter who you are, what you look like, what pay bracket you're in, um, none of that really matters. What really matters is if you feel like you are in need, we are able to help out in some way. If we can't if ourselves do the help, then we will do our best to find someone else that can help. Welcome back to Seeing the Need to Find the Solution, Mental Health 2013, Mental Health First Aid Arizona. Uh, kind of like first aid and uh, CPR, and it's about time that they got some aspects out there to reach not only hopefully this whole state, a lot of the rural areas, but up and beyond that, and hopefully that it carries on through. Uh, Suzanne, one of the things you wanted to talk about was um, uh, what, uh, what the services and the, the equality, I guess, would be of that in reference to saving money on some savings in the, in the community. So why don't we go with that route? Sure. Phil, we receive a thousand phone calls a day between Maricopa County and Pima County. And then what we do is out of those phone calls, we help most people resolve those issues and connect them to care. And uh, I'm just so proud of the people that actually call and they take courage to, to make those phone calls and they do that. And there's about a hundred of those phone calls every day that, you know, they need some more help than just a phone call. And we send the mobile teams out into the community to, to respond to them. And you can see there's a savings, you know, there's, we, we help people in the most economical way to respond. So we're helping people and at the same time we're, we're getting them the care at the lowest possible level. And um, that's important for, for the community to know that we help people, but at the same time, we're saving dollars. You know, many people that if their lives are, are very, very out of control, and sometimes police may interact with an individual, and the police are calling us anywhere between 25 and 30 times a day. And we get out there, and we help these people, and we help them get connected to care. They're not going to jail. We're, we're avoiding those costs of jail, not only avoiding the financial costs, we're avoiding that emotional cost of people going to jail. People with mental illness don't belong in jail. They belong getting help. 
Absolutely. Yes. And you know, from the information that I'll say out there, the study that was done by Arizona National Council last year, I think the average cost was between seventy and eighty thousand to treat somebody with mental illness within the uh, jail system, and about nine thousand, between eight and nine thousand, if they were treated out of the system. Um, interesting enough, uh, and uh, you probably know, I think you were at the same meeting that I was at a long time ago, where they came in from New York, but they were doing different statistics, and they were talking about how uh, violent crime has went down in Arizona, uh, but the incarceration rate has went up for nonviolent crimes. And um, it, it amazes me still to today that uh, uh, what a hard job it's got to be in between uh, that aspect of servicing uh, patients that suffer from a mental illness. Um, mental health is important. We have physical health, which means we all have mental health. Um, you know, what happens if I were to say, okay, by the way, here is enough uh, services to go handle 300,000 of the 365,000 calls you get? I'm sure your face would be delighted in your heart, but then you're going to go, how do I do this? You know, there's, uh, how, do, how, do you, how do you grow if, if all the pieces don't fit? That's got to be very hard in reference to being able to serve more people but have the funding to do so and having uh, stuff spent over here when it could be spent over there. And I know I'm kind of going off, but what I'm getting at is, is the goal is to serve as many people as possible. You're getting 365,000 calls a year. That's correct. That is a lot of hurting people. Yes. Yes. And, and, I'm and, and Phil, you know, there's many more people out there that aren't calling yet. They're afraid to call. There's stigma. They're, they're afraid that if, if I make this phone call, people will think dif differently about me. And, you know, I want to let people know it's a confidential phone call. People can reach out for help. There's many more people than the thousand people that call us that need help. Is there an age, age bracket? There's no, there's no age bracket. There's no criteria. Anybody in our community can call and reach out for help. You know, what I really uh, liked to find was from the very beginning of the segment when you said you can even call for somebody else. Um, I know growing up as somebody who didn't know what recovery was at the time, before I had the blessing and the opportunity to be sober, mm -hmm. that um, my, my parents and people that were close to me, they were more fearful than anything, but they didn't know what to do. They came from the old school. They didn't know that they could call on behalf of somebody else. It was always call the police. Uh, that's the only way to save my son or, or something like that. But being able to call for a friend and saying, hey, I don't know what to do. I know they're depressed, excuse me, and they won't open up. Um, somebody calls for a family member or a friend, uh, adult or something like that. Um, and uh, do you, are you treating that person are you, or do they actually make phone calls to the person? How does that work? So if a, if a person calls in and they're concerned about another person, we're going to help that person think about ways they can better connect with the other people and then sometimes we might say hey let's get that person on the phone with you right now if it's appropriate to do that but we're going to help that person continue to be a support and a help for the other person and you know if the situation is you know serious enough that we're, we're going to actually go do some outreach we're going to go connect with that person on the spot to just make sure that there's the, the situation is safe and, and, and turn things around um. Mr. Steve Isham uh, with David's Hope and a number of other aspects. Steve has a great book on child and family advocacy. Um, he is a big blessing in, uh, in our lives with everything that we do. And Steve, I, I decided to call you at uh, five minutes before you needed to be here today and oh, to put you on. <laughs> but um, I thought it would complement the process uh, because you know we both have the same seats on, uh, on a uh, Justice Alliance Coalition with mental health, mental health and the criminal justice system. Um, when you're talking about that, that element of mental health and it gets to the point of incarceration, but what I want to talk about is when they're released, that crises aspect. Um, one thing that is dear to your heart, I know, is just helping the individual that still suffers. What's something that you can add to the picture that would uh, maybe help somebody out there listening take advantage of Crisis Response Network's services? I think if they, during the, one of the major problems with coming out of our prisons and jails is there's not any real strong transition. So if they at least have that number, that's some place that they can at least get grounded or get some support and help to help make that transition. But they're released from those facilities and there's not really a transition to help them. So I mean, they're incarcerated and everybody's making decisions for them. They make almost no decisions for themselves. When they eat, when they sleep, when they talk, when they walk, everything is controlled. Then all of a sudden they're out on the street and they're having to make decisions that they're not used to making after 30 days, a year, six years, 20 years. 
And then all of a sudden, now I have to make all these decisions. It's incredibly overwhelming. On a, on a county level, um, from experience and also from talking to you, you know, the element of somebody that suffers from mental illness, um, say they, they didn't take their meds, they now are incarcerated, um, they get uh, serviced while they're in, in, in incarcerated, and then they get released. And, and I know transportation is a big issue. It's one of the things we talked about from uh, pre-crisis. Um, you know, they get released and they're kind of, all right, what do I do now? And, and not always do they have somebody to pick them up. And mind you, there's some great agencies out there that do do some services that try to connect services and do some great things. And um, what I want to try to really pinpoint down is uh, there is help. Um, and Suzanne had said it, you can call. Um, phone numbers on your screen. Uh, as you see at the bottom of the screen as well, all the different counties in Arizona, there's also a phone number up there, which is 1-800-203-CARE. Uh, that is for the whole state of Arizona, Arizona as well. Um, when you're dealing with crisis response and you need some one-on-one -on -one attention for yourself, um, or you need to talk about somebody else that's hurting within your own family. And that I really love because the recovery model is, you know, the 12-step, which is, A, you never go alone. Um, when you try to help somebody who is still suffering, you tell them your experience, strength, and hope, so you're not in a judgmental type of way. Um, but I just can't wrap my head around 365,000 calls. That is an amazing amount of people. Um, are you required to keep statistics on how many you actually go out there and serve? Well, absolutely. We keep a, a whole host of statistics. How many people call, how fast we answer the phone, how long our phone calls are. I mean, there's a whole host of um, reporting requirements that, that we fulfill. Suzanne Rabideau, CEO, aside, um, all the stuff that I know you're involved in, aside, if you could change anything. Um, mm. Well, there's two questions, two-part question. Um, if you could change anything and have one wish that would be um, for yourself, for what you do for a living or for the community, um, what would it be to the viewers that are watching? I would say a person who's isolated and afraid to call, that they break through that, that fear and they pick up the phone and they make a phone call and they begin to turn their lives around and they, they have some wholeness and wellness and they're able to engage in the things that they enjoy in life. So if I could have one thing, there'd be more people calling and reaching out for help and making their lives whole. Steve, um, you come on the show. Nate, the reason that you do what you do for the person out there that is um, maybe um, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, that doesn't think they don't have anybody or they lost somebody, what would you say to them? I would say there is help out there and that, that, that they're not alone. One in four adults has a, a diagnosable mental illness or substance abuse problem. One in five adolescents has that same issue. Uh, we're number one in the world in incarcerating our people. We have the number one in we can incarcerate more people in this country per capita than any other nation on the earth. And many of those people, a great number of those people, upwards of 80%, have either a diagnosable mental illness or a learning disability. You know, so they're getting into those situations because of those needs that aren't being met. Phil, I had one more thing. Is that you know we talk about people with mental illness, but it's not just people who have a mental illness or a brain disorder, but people that are just struggling. I mean, a, a life event can impact a person, and it's it's time to turn that around and get life back on a on different track. And so there's a full host of, of reasons why people Absolutely. would would reach out. Suzanne Rabbitoh, CEO of Crisis Response Network. Steve Isham, um, David's Hope. 365,000 calls for crisis in Arizona alone. Pick up the phone, check out Crisis Response Network, and help somebody. My name is Phil McElveen. and see you next Sunday. When I can't see you, I know you're there. When I can't feel you, I will not fear. I will trust in you, and I will not be afraid.